Hello again, everyone. This is Professor Casey. Welcome back. Today we're discussing the second half of Chapter 1, okay, from David Emery Shy's America Narrative History. And this time we're talking about all of the stuff that is going on in Europe um, from before the Columbian era leading all the way up to the era of it, exploration. Okay, so all the stuff that has been going on during the time where native tribes have been thriving in North America, um, a lot of different things going on in Europe. Okay, a very different type of atmosphere um, with a lot of different major events taking place. Okay, and so we kind of have to go back in time a little bit here and, uh, and discuss some of the stuff that is happening before the Spanish and the English and the French ever actually make it to North America. Alright, so the very first thing that we can talk about here is something that ends up disrupting the European way of life that had been in existence at this point for the better part of 1300 years or so. Okay, And this is the end of what is called the feudal system. Okay, And we'll discuss the feudal system a little bit here in a second, but the big event that I really want to talk about here that leads us past this point, gets us kind of out of the Dark Ages period of European history, is the Black Death. Okay. And this is a, a major global catastrophe that occurs between the years 1347 and 1351. Okay. It only lasts for four years. But that being said, this is the very first major global pandemic we have when it comes to uh, a major disease, a major illness. Okay. Now, if you're not familiar with the Black Death itself, okay, in modern terms, scientists have identified this as a bacterial infection called Yersinia pestis, otherwise known as the bubonic plague, okay? And the bubonic plague itself is a very, very nasty disease, okay? Um, in modern terms, thankfully, it can be treated with penicillin, okay? But going back to the Middle Ages, there was virtually no form of modern medicine that was reliable of any kind, okay? It was mo mostly folk remedies with the occasional remedy that had some basic you know, scientific knowledge coming from the Middle East, okay? So medicine at this point in time was virtually non-existent, okay? Now, the disease itself is like this, okay? As I said before, it's a bacteria that is actually spread through uh, contact with fleas, okay? And the fleas themselves attach themselves to rats, okay? And the rats come from a region known as the Black Sea, okay? Allegedly, this is where the term Black Death comes from, okay? Now, the Black Sea is this a uh, landlocked body of water that you see here on the map, kind of in Central Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, kind of on the other side of what is modern day Greece and Turkey, okay? Now, uh, the way that this works is this, um, this virus ends up, uh, when a flea bites a person, okay, the virus gets into their system. Usually the incubation period for this is about three days, give or take. Okay? Sometimes it can go up to a couple of weeks. But the typical basis is about three days. Um, after three days, a person will start to experience chills, fever, their body will start to ache, kind of flu-like symptoms. And then over time, um, what this uh, bacteria does is it essentially attacks the lymphatic system in the person's body. Now, the lymphatic system is what controls the immune response. Anytime your body uh, ends up is fighting off a bacteria, a virus of some kind, your, your lymph nodes will sometimes become swollen, okay? And they're, sometimes the lymph nodes are what are located underneath the jawline on your neck, kind of around your tonsils, uh, kind of up under your ears maybe. Uh, they're located in your armpits and also in your groin area, okay? Uh, now, when this virus sets in, it specifically attacks the lymph nodes to where they swell up. Okay, and not only do they swell up, but you also develop these really nasty blisters on your skin. Okay, and this is where this bacteria basically builds up and builds up. Okay, and these little blisters are called buboes. This is where we get bubonic plague from. And the blisters start off relatively small and gradually they get bigger and bigger and bigger until sometimes they can be the size of your fist. Okay, this is a pretty nasty disease, like I said. Now, one of two things will happen here. If you manage to get these uh, blisters lanced, right, you drain them somehow, someone drains them for you, a physician perhaps, you have a chance of surviving, okay? Trick is, is all the nasty stuff that's accumulated in there, if it gets onto someone else, or if you cough on someone else while you have this, any kind of bodily fluids will transmit this thing. And then the next person gets it and it starts all over again. Now, if it doesn't get lanced, 
the lamp, the uh, the boil on your skin will burst inwards, okay? and all that nasty stuff floods into your bloodstream, and you die of sepsis. Okay, so one way or another, there's only about a 10% survival chance during this particular point in time with this disease. Okay, so this is a really really nasty disease. If someone has plague, chances are just about everybody else around them is going to catch it. Okay, uh, we already are in the midst of a global pandemic right now as I'm recording this. Okay. So we're kind of becoming more and more familiar with the idea of how quickly something like this can transmit. It. But this in particular, because there was no medicine to attack, you know, to attack it or anything like that, it's even deadlier. Okay. And the other problem too is that at this point in time, people are living virtually stacked right on top of one another. Okay. All the major cities in the world are extremely packed. And um, the people who are living kind of at the bottom of the social class totem pole here are the ones who catch it and spread it the most. Okay, So over time, the Black Death ends up depopulating all of Europe by roughly half. Okay, Nearly every other person ends up dying. Okay? So this is a really, really horrible um, uh, instance here. Okay, This would be the modern equivalent of if Ebola virus uh, was somehow um, transmitted into a global pandemic. Okay, so again, there's not really a way for people to successfully fight this and be able to live to tell the tale. Okay, only a few people manage to do that. Now, the feudal system itself, uh, the way that the virus itself ends up affecting this, is the feudal system works kind of like in the way this little triangle diagram does here. Okay, um, at the top of the pyramid, you have a king. Okay, or a monarch of some kind. It can be a king or a queen, whatever. Most of the heads of Europe at this point were kings. Underneath the king, you have a series of nobles. Okay, and the nobles are the ones who control most of the wealth. Okay, they're the ones who uh, end up having some kind of sphere of influence. They have ships that can help with trade. They might have connections with another royal family somewhere else. Underneath the nobles, each noble has a series of knights that swear allegiance to this noble, okay? And each one of the knights, in turn, has castles and land that are worked by peasants. Okay? Now, the peasants are the ones that are attacked the harshest by the Black Death, okay? So, peasants are the ones that are virtually wiped out here, okay? Um, and once this bottom of this totem pole ends up dissolving and collapsing, the entire system collapses. Okay? The knights are not going to get out and work in the field. Okay? They're not going to try to do anything to pick up the slack here. Okay? So the way this would have worked initially is the peasants would have grown crops, they would have brought up animals of, of some kind perhaps. They then pay some kind of tribute to the knights. Okay? The knights would then convert these animals or grain or whatever into money, sell them at market somehow. The money would then go up to the nobles, and the nobles would then tra pay tribute to the king. Okay, so it works kind of upward in that regard. But again, when the peasants are wiped out, the knights, the nobles, they don't really have a whole lot of pull anymore. And so, once half the population is wiped out, again, this is a, a rough estimate, right? It could be as much as half, could be as little as a third, but it was at least a third of the population. Okay, um, Once that ends up happening, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot more job opportunities, okay? People are in more demand now, okay? And, of course, the knights end up becoming almost bankrupt because no one is able to work the fields, okay? And so the peasants themselves end up moving into um, a different sphere of influence, right? Their uh, uh, measure of living gets uh, raised a little bit, okay? They actually are able to make more money because they're in higher demand. They end up... Uh, working in other areas, okay, they start to develop uh, their own uh, particular uh, social class structure themselves, okay? They start to develop disciplines, they become weavers, they become tinkers, tailors, um, barrel makers, smiths, you name it, right? And so we eventually, over time, develop a middle class for the very first time, okay? We no longer have the, the peasants and the wealthy, now we have a little bit of a bridge in the middle here. And so all these people now who are uh, occupying the middle class, right, whether they're bankers or merchants or whatever, they now have a direct line of influence to the ruler, to the king, okay? And all the money that's made in the kingdom comes from the middle class. 
And so the monarchs are no longer relying on these lords, the nobles, the knights, or any of that for income. And so that particular system ends up going into decline. Okay. And so now, once we have this, all of the money that can be made through um, through banking, through uh, through trade, and so forth, ends up becoming something that the king ends up looking more for. Okay. So the merchants themselves, again, are the ones who are going to have to go and explore to find new markets. Okay. And you can kind of see where this is heading now. Okay. The merchants themselves are the ones who end up going off into other directions to find new ways of making money. Okay. And so coming to the Americas, coming to the New World, right? They're they're not really looking for the Americas. They don't know that it, they exist yet. They're looking for something else. But looking elsewhere for new markets is basically all about money, more or less. And so towns and cities that have existed for a while end up growing more and more, and they end up uniting more and more. Okay, so now we don't necessarily have people working out on the farms anymore, uh, working the land and so forth. Now we have people who have moved into cities and who are developing trade guilds and so forth. And cities are becoming more and more metropolitan now. Now, once the Black Death finally manages to dissipate over time, and once society itself starts to kind of bounce back a little bit here, once the middle class starts to make a little bit more money, then we move into the period that is known as the Renaissance. Okay? And the Renaissance lasts sometime from around the middle of the 14th century, once the Black Death ends, sometime into the 17th century. Okay? And the term Renaissance just means rebirth. Okay, and it's exactly what it sounds like. I mean, society is undergoing a massive amount of rebirth here. Um, society is rebranding itself. Okay, again, the entire uh, system inherent in Europe for such a long period of time uh, cannot function anymore. Okay? And so we have to completely reinvent society. And this is not just um, not just economics. We're also talking about new forms of politics, uh, new ways of looking at religion. Okay, religion has been largely uncontested uh, at this point for the better part of five or six hundred years. Okay, once Christianity was able to really take hold in uh, Western Europe, um, the Catholic Church ended up being the uh, the, the major power that existed anywhere in the world. Okay, so now that we're getting more into um, the Renaissance time period, the Catholic Church finally starts to come under fire a little bit. Okay, uh, we've had uh, several periods where um, popes have uh, fallen into corruption of various kinds, um, and people are finally starting to see the cracks in the picture here. Um, there's also advances in science, of course, art and music are all uh, major features of the Renaissance, right? Just like you see up here at the top right, the Statue of David. This is the period when Michelangelo paints the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, right? All the major pieces of art that gain uh, so much attention and so much popularity in, in popular culture all come from this time period, okay? So basically all of um, Western Europe and all of society ends up uh, going through a major overhaul here. Now, the age of exploration comes sometime around the 15th century. Okay? And again, this is right around the same time period um, that we get the voyages of Christopher Columbus for the first time. Okay? So from the 15th century all the way through the 18th century, um, we have all these new advances in naval technology with navigation, um, with um, you know map making and so forth, like you see here. I mean, the first world map um, on, in a very rough sense, was actually um, drawn sometime around the year 1000 by the Vikings, okay? And um, as rough as it may be, it was actually fairly accurate for its time. And as you can see here, this map dates probably sometime from around the 15th or 16th centuries, okay? And of course, all of the major nations that are able to finance expeditions of certain kinds are the ones that have made most of their fortunes during this time period, okay? England, France, Portugal and Spain are the four major ones that end up emerging here as the most powerful nations in the world. And among the Portuguese in particular, uh, we see the beginnings of the African slave trade. Okay? And slave trade, of course, uh, begins sometime around this particular time period. Okay? Um, African nations, in, specifically in Northern Africa, had been in contact with Europe for a few hundred years by this point. Okay? 
Um, they weren't really major contacts, okay? It's not really until Portugal really starts to invade uh, sometime around the 15th or 16th centuries that we really start to see uh, slave trade beginning to emerge anywhere um, concerning Europeans anyway. Um, of course, uh, King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile, right? These are two uh, different um, Spanish um, empires or two Spanish kingdoms, actually, uh, that end up uniting into Aragon and Castile and into Spain itself, right? Uh, and these are the two monarchs that actually end up sponsoring Christopher Columbus, okay? Uh, they are the ones who actually offer money for Columbus to make a trip to the West Indies. Okay? They believe that he will actually be able to sail west and land in India, okay? And of course, as you see here on the map, right, this is before, obviously before America was really discovered, right? You see kind of this uh, little, um, you know, misshapen blob down here at the bottom left on the map that could perhaps represent a nation that they're not aware of. But uh, the, uh, the Far East, people believe that if you sailed, uh, they believe the world was smaller than it was, in other words, right? If you sailed far enough west, you would eventually come around the other side. Okay, so despite all um, evidence to the contrary, despite all popular opinion, um, very few people during this time period believe the world was flat. Okay. They believe that if you sailed uh, too far off the edge of the map, then you might perhaps run into sea monsters or something of that sort, storms of some kind, but um, very few people believe that the world was flat and that you would just fall off. And of course, not only is there you know trade and money going into this, but just a sense of general curiosity. Right? People had all kinds of uh, strange conceptions and misconceptions, really, during the Middle Ages about what lie at the edge of the map. Um, people during the Middle Ages, for instance, believed that Jerusalem was at the center of the world, and that if you went uh, far enough east, you would run into one-eyed monsters bouncing around on one leg, uh, that you would run into uh, man beasts of some kind, that you would run into some sort of monsters um, uh, in whatever direction you went. Okay, so people believe that the world was much smaller and much more bizarre than what it actually is. And of course, religious zeal is a new thing too. Okay, now that religion is being contested, um, religion doesn't just roll over and let it happen. Okay, the Catholic Church uh, responds very, very harshly to anybody who tries to criticize it. Okay, um, and people are very, very eager to stamp out all other native religions during this time period too. Once Christianity um, becomes a, a major contributing factor to exploration, uh, conversion becomes a, a, a mandate very, very quickly. Now, concerning Christopher Columbus, okay? Um, Columbus was born in 1451 and died in 1506. Um, quick note about uh, Columbus, too, is any and all images that you ever see of Christopher Columbus, any paintings or drawings or whatever, none of them were done during his lifetime, okay? And um, so quite simply, we have no idea what he looked like, okay? All the people who painted or sketched him basically invented his face, okay? Um, so the image that you see at the top right here, that's very likely not what he looked like, or someone may have just gotten lucky. Okay. Um, but he actually never had a portrait painted during his lifetime. Um, of course, the three major ships that Columbus ends up um, conscripting here are the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Okay. Um, and you see here on the map, uh, Columbus didn't just sail one time uh, from Spain and land in America. Okay. That's not really how it worked. In fact, Columbus never actually made it to the North American continent. Okay. He only landed uh, on the islands of Cuba and Santo Domingo, which eventually becomes Haiti over time. Uh, so he actually makes it to the Caribbean, but he does not actually make it all the way to the North American mainland. So anybody who tells you that Columbus discovered America is sadly mistaken. Okay. And Columbus did make four voyages, as you, as you see here. Okay. Um, he set sail on August 3rd of 1492 and does reach the Bahamas on the 12th of October of 1492. So, little poem, you know, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue is actually accurate, okay? But that's about as far as it goes. Um, once Columbus does land, okay, uh, he encounters people that he calls the Indios, okay? Because he believes that these people are actually people from India. He believes that he has landed in India. So again, big mistake on his part, right? Um, the actual people themselves are the Tainos or the Arawaks. Okay, these are 
um, tribes people that lived in this particular region, okay, primarily in uh, Santo Domingo itself. Um, and quick note about this too is he very quickly says that he believes they would make fine servants, quote unquote. Um, so Columbus's entire approach to this, uh, because these people are so welcoming to him and his group, because they, um, you know, they, they've never seen Europeans before, right? They've never seen uh, people who arrive wearing fancy clothing, strange hats. Uh, some of them come wearing uh, armor of some of some kind, um, plumes in their hats, right? They have the appearance of uh, something perhaps even divine, okay? And so uh, for the native people to kind of welcome them very quickly, to, to kind of grovel and so forth, um, it's, it's a massive miscommunication. If the Europeans believe that these people are going to be their servants, and they do turn them into slaves in many cases. Um, and uh, of course, the natives themselves you know, miscommunicate and perhaps believe that these people are gods. Um, the island of Hispaniola, which becomes eventually Haiti in the Dominican Republic down here, uh, is discovered a few weeks later. Okay, so uh, initially Columbus does land on Cuba, kind of comes down the line here on this blue line here. Um, lands, uh, makes landfall in Santo Domingo, comes down, and eventually does go back uh, to Spain. Okay. Now, two years later, after Columbus has made a couple of these voyages, he makes about one voyage every year, okay, for the next few years, um, he uh, ends up uh, overseeing what's called the Treaty of Tordesillas. Okay. And what happens here is this is an agreement that's made between Spain and Portugal. Okay. The Western Hemisphere of the world, which uh, has just been discovered to be much bigger than it, we thought it was before, okay, uh, ends up going to Spain. And then Africa and Brazil are going to be given to Portugal for the slave trade. So the Portuguese at this point are the ones who are really beginning to corner the market on the slave trade. Um, they take slaves from Africa take them to Brazil, where they end up conditioning them, perhaps, or uh, dropping them off for slavery for their colonies there, and then they come back to Brazil after that. Okay, So there's a triangular slave trade that ends up happening here, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a future chapter. Um, eventually, after the Treaty of Tordesillas is signed, the Pope steps in. Okay. And because Spain and Portugal are both um, Catholic nations, okay, this, the Pope actually has a lot of clout here. Uh, Pope Alexander VI mandates that conversion of the natives is going to be uh, is going to go uh, hand in hand with any kind of exploration. Okay, if we're going to uh, you know try to colonize these places, if we're going to try to discover anything, then we are going to spread Catholicism there as well. Okay, and by any means necessary, unfortunately. Not only do we spread the Catholic message here, but we also spread disease. Okay. Um, and the Spaniards and the Brazil or the uh, Portuguese are the ones that spread smallpox. They spread measles, typhus. All these are brought to the island of Hispaniola. And within a few years, only maybe within a couple of years, um, most of the population of the island is completely wiped out. Um, and most of this is not done necessarily to be uh, to be cruel. Okay, the whether or not the, the Spaniards and the Portuguese knew that this was something that they were bringing with them or not. It's kind of up in the air, at least initially anyway. Uh, eventually it does get used as a form of uh, biological warfare. Um, in some cases, uh, the Spaniards, if they knew that they had to weaken a tribe of some kind, they would specifically um, hand over smallpox um, laden blankets to people, okay? Uh, blankets that people had died in, blankets that people had coughed on, that had bled on, and so forth. They would give them to the natives, and the natives would then very quickly get sick and be wiped out. Okay. So um, again, Columbus, um, not necessarily the, the shiny example of, um, of a figure to look up to. Okay. He's certainly gotten a lot of negative press in recent history, especially within the last uh, few months and few years, as we've seen with many of the protests in the United States. Um, uh, statues of him have been attacked, have been toppled, and so forth. Um, so the you know beginning of European colonization in America, not off to a good start. Now, as for future explorations, again, we don't necessarily improve very much very quickly. Um, the individual Amerigo Vespucci is the one who sails to the New World in 1499 and declares it a new continent. 
Okay, he realizes that, that this is not uh, necessarily a just a small island of some kind. This is a much bigger place. Okay, so he is the one who actually lands on the North American continent for the first time, and within eight years, um, the continent itself is designated as America on a map named for Amerigo Vespucci, which you see who you see up here at the top right. Now, John Cabot is the very first um, British explorer that we have uh, who ends up uh, coming to the Americas, and he discovers what is called Newfoundland. Okay? Um, and just as a quick little side note here concerning Newfoundland, Newfoundland is in modern-day Canada. Okay? This is off the eastern coast of Canada. Newfoundland was actually discovered by uh, Europeans um, probably about four or five hundred years before John Cabot landed there. Okay? Um, there was a series of Icelandic um, explorations by Vikings uh, under Eric the Red that have been uh, called the Vinland Sagas that were actually written during this, uh, during right around the year 1000, maybe even a little bit before, where you actually had Viking explorers who managed to make it all the way westward across the Atlantic and landed in Newfoundland and actually had contact with the Native Americans living there. Um, the Vinland Sagas can actually be found in book form. Uh, if you ever are interested in looking, I'll actually post some of it on the discussion board if I can. Um, but the, uh, the Vinland sagas deal, of, of course, with the fact that the Vikings come here. They have uh, a, a couple of skirmishes with Native Americans, and they don't stay here very long. Okay? But uh, once John Cabot comes, he discovers Newfoundland in 1497, but he very quickly abandons it because of other political issues going on in England. Okay, not very much funding going into it, and so he can't really um, establish a, a colony there yet. Okay, so it takes a while before England is actually able to establish a foothold anywhere. Ferdinand Magellan is another one that people are very uh, familiar with. Okay, he's the first to circumnavigate the globe. Okay, uh, he's a Portuguese explorer. He discovers the southern tip of South America and is the first one to sail into the Pacific Ocean in 1519. Um, and unfortunately, when he lands on Guam and in the Philippine Islands, the natives end up killing him. Okay. So after Magellan is killed, um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, his crew members end up leaving him behind and sail back home. Okay. So they're the ones who bring the story back. Now, concerning religion, if we talk a little bit about this, uh, we have to go back to the figure of Martin Luther. Okay. Martin Luther was born in 1483 and died in 1547. Okay. He was a, uh, a German monk who actually began to look at the Catholic Church, its principles, its rulers, its leaders, and realize that there's too much corruption going on in it and that he did not agree with it. Um, and this begins what we know now as the Protestant Reformation. Okay. And this is the, the major precipitating religious conflict uh, of the modern era, okay, of the common era. Okay. Um, specific things that Martin Luther attacks here, number one is something called the sale of indulgences. Okay. And this was a, a, a practice in the Catholic Church by which basically uh, the Catholic Church had the belief that there were three different levels of the afterlife. Okay. And in some cases, some people still believe this, some don't. But if you, the Catholic belief at the time was that if you died, um, if you had all of your sins forgiven, Right, and you gained absolution from a priest, you were given the last rites, you would go to heaven. Okay? If you died without any kind of um, absolution, okay, if you had committed some kind of sin uh, during your life, it may have been minor, um, you would then go to purgatory. Okay? Purgatory is some kind of a middle level, a temporary hell, so to speak. Okay? Is a place you would go to receive a certain amount of torture for a certain amount of time to purify you, to purge you. This is where the term purgatory comes from. You would be purged of that sin and then finally be allowed into heaven eventually. And then, of course, if you were unrepentant, and you died, you committed a bunch of sins, you went to hell. Okay? Where indulgences come in is where the Catholic Church basically says that if you have a family member who has died, or if you yourself are dying or something like that, or even if you're in perfect health, and you want to secure your place in heaven, if you want to buy your way out of purgatory, you buy an indulgence. Okay? It's basically a written note from the Catholic Church that says that you will have X number of years removed from your sentence in purgatory, and you will be allowed into heaven. Okay? Um, in modern terms, most people would look at this and 
maybe lift an eyebrow. Okay, uh, this seems to be some kind of a racket of some kind. Uh, but indulgences were extremely popular, though. Um, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome uh, was actually, where the Sistine Chapel is, was actually built by the sale of indulgences. Okay? Uh, this was a multi, multi-million dollar, I guess, in, in today's terms, in Western American <laughs> ideas, um, industry. Okay? This was an extremely wealthy industry in doing this. Um, and, of course, as we said before, some of the popes during this time were also engaged in multiple types of corruption. Um, they would oversee orgies. Some of them uh, were known pederasts. Some of them were uh, had multiple illegitimate children. Many of them murdered their predecessors. I mean, it was not necessarily um, not not a very uh, moralistic office. Let's put it that way. And Martin Luther was able to see through some of this. Um, Martin Luther also believed that salvation was supposed to come from belief and not from any kind of deeds done in life or from purchases of any kind. That's where he says that indulgences are immoral, right? You shouldn't be able to buy your way into heaven. You should be able to, um, you know, do the right thing, be a good person, and believe in, uh, you know, believe in Jesus, believe in God, the Christian idea, and get into heaven that way. He also believed in democratizing Christianity. Okay. And democracy itself was something that was virtually unheard of at this point in time. Okay. Uh, democracy, of course, originates, is given the, you know, the designation of having originated in ancient Greece. Okay. Um, and many uh, Christians during this time period believed that um, ancient Greece was associated with paganism, and they refused to even entertain the idea that pagans were enlightened in any other way greater than Christ. Okay and especially enlightened greater than the Catholic Church. And so this is why religion had such a great hold on Western culture for such a long period of time. Um, democratizing Christianity, saying that there should not be a pope, that there should not be anyone who is a direct representative of God, who should be held in higher esteem than anyone else, was considered blasphemous. Okay? And so for Martin Luther to say, well, we need to have individual churches or individual freedom of belief in this case, he believed that it was a good idea but the Catholic Church, of course, was trying to silence him. And he also believed that the Bible itself, which hadn't been in circulation for very long at this point, by the way, um, that the Bible itself should be printed in German, should be printed in the modern language, in the common language of the people. Okay? Um, because at this point in time, very, very few people were actually literate. Okay? Universities did exist. Some of them did exist from the 1200s and 1300s. Um, but uh, most of the time, the people who were literate were monks, okay? And the only way you could become literate was if you uh, became a monk, joined the Catholic Church, and even then, you weren't always literate, okay? Um, all the masses that were given in Catholic churches were done in Latin, okay? So if you were a common person who spoke the German language of the time or some other language that was a common vernacular language, if you went to church, you had no idea what the priest was saying. Okay, you just had to sit there and listen and just kind of take the cues from everybody around you on what to do. And so Martin Luther says, well, if we're going to have these scriptures available to everyone, we need to make them available in the common language. And even all the way up until the 1950s, even in the United States in some cases, um, Catholic masses were still presented in Latin. Okay? So there's a, a gradual change that occurs over a long, long period of time. Now, of course, the Pope absolutely detests Martin Luther for doing this. Okay? Uh, Leo X here actually comes out and says that Martin Luther is going to be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Excommunication is possibly the worst sentence that a, a Pope can hand down to a fellow Catholic. Okay? Um, this basically says this person is cut off from any and all benefits given to them by the Catholic Church. You cannot receive any kind of blessing, you cannot take communion, you cannot be given last rites, you cannot be absolved of your sins, and you cannot be buried in holy ground anywhere. Okay? So if you die, you're basically condemned to hell, is what it amounts to. Right? And uh, you have to be buried in a ditch or something like that. Okay? So it's basically being cut off entirely from the Catholic Church. And not only does Leo X do this, he also tries to have Martin Luther killed. Okay, tries to sentence him to death. But Martin Luther is actually protected by a local German prince named Frederick III. Right? He's called the Elector of Saxony. Okay, Saxony is part of Germany. 
Uh, but he's basically a minor prince who actually ends up harboring Martin Luther, protecting him from the Pope. Um, and uh, Frederick III actually embraces a lot of what Martin Luther likes here. Okay. And so it takes a few years, right? It takes until 1555. But something called the Treaty of Augsburg is finally pronounced here. And this is what allows local princes to determine what kind of faith their subjects choose to practice. Okay. So in other words, it basically removes the teeth from the Pope, it says that the Pope no longer has the authority to mandate what religion people practice. Now it can be local rulers who do. Okay. And this is a major, major step. Okay. The Treaty of Augsburg is something that's very unprecedented. And of course, the, the Catholic Church is just foaming at the mouth. It's so angry over this. Okay. Um, Catholic Church has enjoyed massive amounts of wealth throughout the centuries by this point and considers itself to be the direct inheritor of, um, you know, of the office of St. Peter, and right? it believes that it has a direct line to Jesus Christ. So for it to be challenged in this way and to basically be shot down a little bit here, it's a big, big deal. Now, the next stage of belief here comes in the form of John Calvin, okay? Uh, John Calvin in 1536 writes a book called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. Okay? And John Calvin is a British man. Um, he writes in this book that he believes all humans are condemned from the very beginning by the idea of original sin. Okay? Now, original sin in the Christian ideology says that all human beings have a curse put on them because of their relationship to Adam and Eve, the first two humans in the Christian uh, creation myth here. Okay. idea here is that because humans were cast out of the Garden of Eden and cursed by God to toil in the fields for the rest of their days, all humans contain the stain. Okay. And that somewhere along the line, Christ has looked at all the people who will ever live and has handpicked the people who are going to be predestined for salvation. Okay. So basically, we don't know who it is, but by some form of lottery, God, Jesus, whoever you want to designate here, ends up pulling people out and destining them for salvation. Okay. We don't know who. Okay, You could do everything right in your life. You could do everything to serve God. But if you're not predestined, you could be destined to burn instead. Okay, So this is kind of an unpopular idea, as you could imagine. Okay, John Calvin also believes in the ideas of strict morals, of hard work. Um, and he also... Uh, carries the idea that ends up um, ends up being transmitted into the future into future denominations called the presbytery. Okay, this is basically where you have shared governance of a church through elders and ministers. Okay, and most of the modern Protestant uh, denominations today, the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, things like that, all have their origins in terms of church governance with John Calvin. Okay. and particularly the Presbyterian Church and the Baptist Church. Um, and of course, the German and Dutch Reformed churches also go along with this, not only the Presbyterians, the Puritans, who we'll talk a little bit about here in, in the future, and uh, the Huguenots in France. Huguenots are um, Protestant French, uh, which is at this point a contradiction in terms because France is a Catholic nation. And the other thing that makes John Calvin and his ideas so unpopular is his belief that all people have sin attached to them, okay? and that all people everywhere, including monarchs, including popes, including all major rulers everywhere, anybody in authority, also falls into this lottery. Okay? So you could be a pope, you could be a king, you could be a church elder, and you could be still predestined to burn. All right, so now we move on to England, okay? And here's where things can get a little bit complicated, but I've tried to provide as much of a visual here to kind of help you understand things as I narrate, okay? Because now we're talking about the transformation of England's relationship with the Catholic Church, transforming it into the Church of England, okay? And it all begins with Henry VIII, who you see up here at the top, okay? Henry VIII is married to Catherine of Aragon, the one woman you see to his left here. Henry, of course, is the king of England. Catherine of Aragon is related to the king of Spain. Okay. Now, it's worth noting that all of the heads of Europe at this time are all related to one another somehow, whether through marriage or as cousins or what have you, and it continues that way to this day. 
Okay. Henry and Catherine are married initially, and they have a daughter named Mary, who you see here underneath them. Okay. Over time, though, Henry gets bored with Catherine, okay? and he ends up falling in love with a woman who is his mistress, a woman named Anne Boleyn, who you see here to his right. Now, because Henry is so bored, and because he thinks he has so much authority, he goes to the Pope and asks the Pope to grant him a divorce so that he can get rid of Catherine of Aragon and marry his mistress, Anne Boleyn. Trick with this, though, is Catherine of Aragon is also related to the Pope. <laughs> and so when Henry asks the Pope, the Pope says no, says that he doesn't want his cousin to receive this kind of indignation just because Henry cannot slake his lust. Okay. Henry, of course, reacts just how you would expect him to. He's very full of himself, he's very angry, and he decides to do the most radical thing he could have done in that he separates himself completely from the Catholic Church and says, I'm the Pope now. And so that's exactly what happens. Henry begins what is called the Church of England. Most of the liturgy and most of what ends up happening in the Church of England is virtually identical to what happens in the Catholic Church, except the monarch of England is actually the head of the Church of England. Okay? And you have the Archbishop of Canterbury as the individual who is kind of the head of actual church practices. Okay? So Henry goes to the newly elected Archbishop of Canterbury, okay, a fellow he himself is appointed, and asks for a divorce, and he is granted one. Okay? So now, extremely controversially, as you can imagine, Henry divorces Catherine of Aragon, and she and their daughter Mary are sent off into exile. Okay? Henry then turns around and does exactly what he set out to do. He marries his mistress, Anne Boleyn. Okay? Two of them are married, and they end up having a daughter, Elizabeth. Now, over time, unfortunately for Anne, it's revealed that she has actually been carrying on an affair with another fellow. Okay? And when Henry hears about this, he declares that she is guilty of high treason against the crown and that it merits her being executed. So he has her beheaded. Now, Elizabeth's future is up in the air now. Okay? Many people in Europe believe that Elizabeth, even though she is... Um, you know, the one that Henry has in mind to succeed her, um, most people believe that she is illegitimate because most people don't recognize Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn. Okay, so moving on to the next wife now, two wives down. Henry then falls in love with a woman named Jane Seymour. Okay, she is considered to be a very plain woman, but Henry does love her very deeply. Okay, so much so that they do end up having a son here named Edward. Okay. Problem is, though, Jane dies in childbirth, okay? And, of course, Henry is devastated, okay? uh, He doesn't quite know what to do with himself for a while until he finds comfort in the arms of a woman named Anne of Cleves, fourth wife, okay? Henry and Anne of Cleves are not exactly getting along very well, okay? She hasn't done anything to really upset him or anything, but he believes that she is extremely boring, okay? Uh, she rejects all of his romantic advances. In fact, the rumor is that they never actually consummated their marriage. And so Henry has the marriage annulled. Okay? We then move on to Catherine Howard. Okay? And Catherine Howard is very similar in many respects to Anne Boleyn. Okay? She comes from a wealthy family. She's outspoken. She's a socialite. She's attractive to Henry's eye. And the two of them get along very famously until we have a repeat of the situation with Anne. Catherine Howard has been carrying on an affair with another man. And so she is also given the axe. Okay. Now, Henry <laughs> has not got a very good track record going on at this point. Okay. When we finally get to his final wife, Catherine Parr, okay, um, by this point, Henry now has three different potential heirs to his throne. Mary, who is living in exile, Elizabeth, who he still initially wants to be his successor, and Edward. Okay. Edward, because he is a male, ends up coming first before the other two girls. Okay. Moving on to Catherine Parr, Henry by this point is getting on in years. He suffers from a lot of gout, he has uh, a lot of health issues, and he finally ends up dying while he's married to Catherine Parr. So she is the only one who actually survives, okay? aside from Anne of Cleves and Catherine of Aragon. So, 
now that that first level has been wiped out, now that Henry has died, okay, initially the throne goes to Edward, okay. Unfortunately, though, Edward doesn't live much longer, okay. He only lives to be about, uh, I believe, about 16 years old before he actually succumbs to a fever, okay. Now the question of succession goes back to Mary or Elizabeth, okay. And remember, this is still a major controversy as to whether or not the Catholic Church should come back in, because Mary herself is a Catholic, or if Elizabeth should take charge. And Elizabeth is a Protestant. Okay. She is a member of the Church of England. So what ends up happening here is Mary decides that she is going to take over. Okay, And by this point, England has been a country that has been turned into a Protestant country for a long time. And when Mary comes into the throne, she ends up cleaning house. And by cleaning house, I mean she actively hunts down Protestants and burns them at the stake. And her reign is what's known as the reign of Bloody Mary. This is where we get the term Bloody Mary from. Uh, Mary ends up persecuting uh, Protestants wherever she can and ends up uh, becoming a very bitter old woman and dying uh, a very bitter death. Once Mary dies, then the throne goes to Elizabeth. Okay. And Elizabeth I is uh, the one who ushers in the quote-unquote golden age of England. Okay. She is the one who um, officially says that England is now going to be a Protestant country, that this is going to be the country where the Church of England is actually going to be established. She ends up completely doing away, cutting all ties with the Catholic um, system of belief, uh, cutting ties with all of the uh, Catholic priests, has them run out of the country and officially puts her seal of approval on the, the Church of England. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, though, is uh, nicknamed the Virgin Queen because she never actually has any heirs. Okay. Uh, she never officially marries, although she does have several lovers. Um, whether or not she actually has children is still up in the air, too. We really don't know that for sure. But she does actually end up having a bad time with her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, and her cousin, okay, Mary Queen of Scots, is one who is very eager to um, uh, help take control of uh, the English throne. Okay, she believes that uh, Mary Queen of Scots, by the way, is a Catholic, and she wants to take control in the same way that uh, Elizabeth's half sister Mary the First would have. Okay, Mary Queen of Scots and Mary the First, two different people. Okay. Um, Elizabeth is so bitterly enamored with Mary Queen of Scots, hates her so much that she actually has her murdered, okay? Murders her own cousin so that she can retain power. Mary Queen of Scots, though, at the same time, ends up having a son, James. Okay. And Mary, after she dies, passes on her title to her son, James, who becomes James VI of Scotland, okay? But once Elizabeth ends up dying in 1603, now there's no one left in line for the English throne except for the, do the son of her rival, James. And so when James ends up coming into the mix, okay, he's the next one in line for the throne, he becomes James I of England, for whom the King James Bible is named. Okay? And so this begins the Stuart line. Okay? Uh, the Stuart is the, the family that comes from Scotland here. Okay, now going back over to Spain very quickly here before we go back. Spain at this point has been very, very busy. Okay, it's established several different colonies, all in the, the islands in the Bahamas. Hispaniola, Santo Domingo, and Puerto Rico, and Cuba are all now established as permanent Spanish colonies. Okay, beginning in 1508 and going all the way through 1514. And the Spanish motto at this point is serve God and the king and also get rich. Okay, the Spanish are out for gold. That's their primary target here. They're not necessarily out for slaves like the Portuguese are, um, and they're not really out for permanent land to colonize like the English eventually are, okay? But they're only out for gold, whatever they can reap from the land itself and bring back. One particular individual who actually is a member of the Catholic Church at this point, uh, a priest named Bartolome de las Casas, uh, is brought over with the Spaniards to try to help convert the natives. Okay? Because remember, the, the Pope at this particular time has mandated that any and all exploration done uh, by Catholic nations 
is going to carry forward the Catholic message as well. And De Las Casas looks at all this and he says that the treatment of the natives by the Europeans is horrible. He says that the, the natives are being enslaved, they're being beaten, uh, the women are being raped, um, people are being murdered, uh, and he says that everything that the Europeans, the Spaniards in particular, are doing is horrible. He says they've committed irreparable crimes against the natives, he says, and um, he doesn't want any part of it. He's one of the only dissenters in the midst of all this. He's one of the only voices that speaks up against all this. And unfortunately, once the Spaniards do arrive and take control of most of the Caribbean, most of the native tribes within the Caribbean are completely dead and wiped out within a few years. Okay? And again, a large part of this has to do with the fact um, that disease has come in. Okay? It's, it's passive in that regard, but it's also active in many regards because the Spaniards are actively trying to wipe them out. Okay? They're trying to move them out of the way um, so that they can actually gain control of whatever resources they can. And of course, by the time we get into the 1540s, we also get the emergence of Hernan Cortez. Okay? And Cortez is the one who ends up clashing with the Aztecs in Mexico. Okay? Cortez ends up sailing from Cuba down to the Mexican peninsula looking for gold. Okay? He realizes that there might not be much to be found on Santo Domingo or Cuba, so let's sail across the Gulf to Mexico. Along the way, he ends up recruiting uh, some of the enemies of the Aztec culture, specifically the Totemacs. Okay? There are also there's several other uh, cultures uh, living under Aztec rule who believe that the Aztecs themselves are actually too imperial, who believe that they are actually there um, to, you know, to put down other local tribes. Okay? And so this is kind of an enemy of my enemy is my friend type situation. So Cortez ends up um, employing several other native tribes in the region to help him. And when he finally reaches Tenochtitlan, right, on, on the surface of Lake Texcoco, he actually is um, welcomed into the city very peacefully by Montezuma II, because Montezuma believes that Cortez is a god, believes that he is the incarnation of uh, Quetzalcoatl, okay, the, the serpent god, right? Uh, and again, a lot of this has to do with the fact, unfortunately, that the, um, the Spaniards themselves arrive wearing um, shining plate armor, right? riding horses, wearing plumes on their heads. And if you ever look at any of the visual representations of Aztec gods, um, there, there's a, an eerie similarity between them and a Spanish knight wearing armor. Okay? Um, and many of the um, Spaniards, or many of the uh, Aztecs at this point had never seen a horse before either. So when they see, you know, people wearing armor riding around on a horse, they believe that they're centaurs or some kind of mythological creature. Okay. So they welcome them in, believing them to be divine. And unfortunately, Cortez immediately takes control. Okay. Uh, takes Montezuma the second captive, demands that the um, that the Aztecs begin mining for more gold, and 20% of the gold that is actually taken from, um, from Tenochtitlan is actually sent back to Spain. Okay. So now Cortez ends up taking control of the city, trying to force them to, um, to mine more gold for him. And the Aztecs are so angry with Montezuma for allowing this to happen that they attack and kill him for treason and end up turning on the Spanish very quickly. Okay. Try to force the Spanish out of the city and the Spanish end up uh, laying siege to the city for 85 days. Okay, this is a long, drawn-out affair. Um, one quick note, too, about um, siege warfare is anytime uh, a city is brought under siege, um, the people inside, unless they have food, typically end up starving to death. It's usually not combat that ends up killing them. It's usually um, starvation and or disease. Okay? And unfortunately, after 85 days, that's exactly what ends up happening here. Smallpox is what ends up wiping out most of the Aztecs. Okay? Uh, and Cortez reports that 117,000 of them are killed. Okay. Whether that number is accurate or not, whether it's something that he has made up, if he has actually gone around and counted bodies, um, who can say? Okay. At this point in time, people were very eager to make up numbers um, to, to report back to their superiors. So it's not really known whether that's accurate or not. 
And Cortez is rewarded for doing all this by being named the first governor of New Spain. Okay, New Spain ends up taking control of most of the Mexican peninsula and what is all of modern day Mexico. Meanwhile, Francisco Pizarro sails from Panama down into Peru and ends the Incan Empire with blood and fire and steel. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, he ends up taking control of the Incans, takes all their gold, takes women, takes slaves, and of course, as we already know, um, other diseases end up being brought there as well, and the Incans are wiped out very much the same way that the Aztecs are. So both of these happen very close uh, in time to one another. Um, Cortes ends up destroying the Aztec Empire around 1519, and uh, the Incan Empire is destroyed in 1531. Most of the uh, Incan um, refugees are destroyed by 1572. Now, after all this occurs, after Pizarro comes in, after Cortes comes in, uh, after all of the settlements that have been uh, made, all the conquests that have been enacted by Spain, now we get the empire of New Spain. Okay, So all of the pink region that you see here, all down the western uh, border from going all the way from modern day California, all the way down here to, um, to the Andes Mountains, all of that is part of New Spain. Okay? And each one of these areas is divided up into uh, different viceroyalties. Okay, so you have a viceroy who is in charge of each one of these areas. So one of New Spain, one of New Granada, and New Castile, and La Plata. Okay, uh, Cortez, as we've already said, is the viceroy of New Spain. Okay. Um, each one of these areas is divided up then into several different parcels of land. Okay, these are given to army officials, uh, and these parcels of land are called encomiendas. Okay, and this is done in exchange for tribute, very similar to the feudal system that we talked about. Okay, so an encomienda is very similar to uh, like a parcel of land that a knight would own. Okay, and the people who are forced to work uh, in the fields, trying to kind of resurrect this feudal system, are the Native Americans. Okay, uh, and of course the natives themselves are given the worst kind of treatment you can imagine. Okay, um, they're treated as serfs, which is just another word for a peasant or a servant. Okay. Um, and the encomenderos are essentially the, the knightly lords uh, from Spain here, and the priests. Okay. The priests have been mandated to convert them by any means necessary. Uh, the natives are pulled away from their tribes. Um, they have their hair cut. They have uh, their religion taken away from them. They have their native dress taken away from them. Uh, they're abused, they're whipped. Um, and they're, they're often forcibly baptized and being and put to work in these uh, uh, encomiendas. And again, the Spanish go about just systematically converting the natives themselves. Again, they often do it by force. The natives don't want this to happen. Okay? Uh, they're often forced into um, being baptized. They, they dunk them in water and force them to, you know, to be baptized here. Um, and by the year 1700, which is around when this map is uh, alleged to kind of cover here, um, there's over 300 missions in New Spain. Okay, so from California all the way down through Texas, Mexico, all the way down to the Isthmus of Panama here, there's over 300 Catholic missions that exist. And again, even though Bartolomeo de las Casas does his best to campaign for peace and all this and say, do not force these people, right, we have to do the right thing, goes completely unnoticed. Something we can briefly discuss here that ends up uh, occurring in the aftermath of the Spanish explorations and conquests in the New World is something that we call the Columbian Exchange. Okay? And of course we call it Columbian because it has to do with Christopher Columbus being kind of the instigator of this. And the Columbian Exchange is the transfer of plants, animals, and diseases from one side of the earth to the other during the 15th and 16th centuries, okay? especially during the Spanish conquests. Among the different things that are brought to America, okay, when it comes to domesticated livestock, okay, horses, cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, and chickens, okay, there's very few domesticated animals here in the Americas except for alpacas, as we've already discussed. When it comes to wild animals, honeybees and rats are the two primary things brought from Europe. Uh, again, here in the Americas, honeybees didn't really exist. 
Okay, and neither did rats, unfortunately. When it comes to plants, okay, we actually do bring over quite a few different plant species. Okay, rice, wheat, barley, oats, grapes, um, different kinds of melons, coffee, olives, bananas, daisies, and dandelions. Right, two different types of flowers, sugar cane. Okay, a lot of these have their origins even in the Mediterranean, uh, different parts of the world. Some of them even have their origins um, in, uh, in parts of Turkey and other places like that. So uh, we've, we've really begun to completely change the ecology of, of the New World. And of course, when it comes to disease, Europeans really take the cake here. Okay? Um, typhus, smallpox, the flu, diphtheria, uh, bubonic plague, as we've already talked about, measles, malaria, cholera, and yellow fever, um, all of those end up coming over. And this particular image that you see up here at the top right, um, this is something that is kind of been debated upon as to what's actually occurring here. The, the individual on the right is an individual suffering from smallpox. That much is pretty evident. Um, their body is covered with these little pustules, which is a very common image of smallpox. Okay? If an individual survived, those pustules would end up scarring and leave very uh, noticeable divots in the skin. And of course, this person is covered in a blanket, okay, so they're, they're suffering. Um, the individual who is uh, perhaps taking care of them or talking to them, though, um, appears, there's a little um, wisp of what looks like perhaps cloud coming out of their mouth. It's hard to tell if this person is talking or if they're coughing, okay, um, because this was actually a, um, as I said before, this was actually a form of um, uh, biological warfare at one point, giving, um, you know, blankets that were infected with smallpox and other things to natives uh, was a very common practice. So whether this individual is a physician or if this person is, um, you know, someone who is infecting someone, it's kind of hard to say. But this comes from a larger sketch of multiple individuals engaged in this type of thing. So whether it actually depicts a hospital or an instance where uh, a tribe is being infected, it's hard to say. Stuff that's taken back to Europe in terms of plants, of course, most of the crops we've already discussed, okay, including uh, tobacco, vanilla, and quinine. Okay, quinine is eventually used uh, as a way to, um, uh, I believe, to treat malaria. Okay, I believe it's actually used as that at some point. As far as animals go, we do bring back turkeys. Okay, turkeys are the only uh, real um, native animal to North America that Europeans are that interested in. And when it comes to disease, um, syphilis is kind of up in the air. We don't really know if that was something that you know, originated here or not in the Americas. Um, Chagas disease is something that is um, uh, uh, distributed by a, a beetle that um, has a, a specific bite. And Chagas disease is similar in many ways to like a, a flu type situation, uh, but it can turn deadly over time. I believe it can turn septic if I'm not mistaken. Um, so in terms of disease, there's not really a whole lot of indigenous diseases to the Americas at this point. When it comes to some of the colonies that are established, the very first European colony that's permanently established on the North American continent is St. Augustine in Florida. Okay. Uh, this is established in 1565, okay? and it's the first Spanish outpost in North America specifically. And the reason that it's established is uh, to combat the uh, encroaching French presence that is actually beginning to arrive uh, in the southern portion of the country. Okay? Um, French Protestants, who we've very briefly discussed already, they call, they're called Huguenots, okay? um, try to establish different colonies in Florida and in South Carolina during the 1560s. And the French Protestants are actually trying to escape religious persecution because if you recall, uh, France at this point is a very, very devoutly Catholic country. Okay. Uh, and they're trying to escape a lot of the religious warfare that's going on in Europe at this point. Uh, once the Protestant Reformation gets underway um, during, the, um, during the 15 and 1600s, um, there is a ton of uh, conflict where people are actually killing one another because they're either Protestant or Catholic. Okay. Uh, and so a lot of people who are trying to practice their religion without being killed end up leaving their country of birth and actually coming to uh, the New World. Okay. And so with the, the Huguenots themselves, they try to come to the United States and they end, or come to America, okay? But they end up getting um, uh, killed in the process by either natives or by um, the Catholic Spaniards who are already here, okay? 
Um, but St. Augustine becomes the first European town in the New World, okay? Uh, and Castillo de San Marcos that you see here is actually the very first European fort built in North America. It's actually a major tourist attraction now. Um, you can see it's a, a large um, kind of a star-shaped fort, uh, has all these different fortifications. It was built in the 1600s. Um, in 1565, the Spanish soldiers actually attacked Fort Caroline in, uh, uh, in, in Florida here, and all the men over the age of 15 are hanged. This is uh, a Huguenot settlement here is what I was trying to get at. Um, and again, this is justified because, again, the Catholic Church still says at this point that it's okay to kill a Protestant. Okay. Um, another major instance that occurs here is there's actually a group of Huguenots that shipwreck on the Florida coast, and uh, the Spanish commander nearby actually has them all killed uh, because they refuse to convert. Okay? They've already been in a shipwreck, and so rather than you know survive the shipwreck and be thankful that they're alive, they're killed anyway because they refuse to convert to Catholicism. Okay? So the, the religious wars going on during this time are extremely unforgiving. When it comes to the southwest portion of the country, the Spanish are gradually moving north out of Mexico. Um, and a lot of the settlements uh, during this time period are established primarily in New Mexico, California, and Texas. Okay? Um, and a lot of the settlements are surrounded um, by a Spanish mission. Okay? That's the typical uh, settlement um, system that's established here. They're not really established as secular communities. They're established primarily as a uh, mission. And the, the map that you see here is actually a pretty decent um, representation of a Spanish mission, kind of the, the way that it would be set up. Okay, it would have a, a large wall that would be, um, you know, that would surround the entire area. You would have a convent with a church established in the middle, kind of, of everything. Um, different little dormitories, kind of in the northern part here for Native Americans to live in, uh, again, forcibly. Uh, of course, you would have different gardens, you would have a well and a cemetery. Um, and uh, surrounded by two or three gates, perhaps, here and there, okay. with a granary attached to one side. So um, very much like you would see with, a, um, again, like a, a Spanish or a Catholic convent, right? This, the people who live there essentially live there to, to work and pray, and that's about it. Okay. Uh, and most of these um, Spanish missions that are established in the southwest portion are very sparsely populated and uh, extremely poor too. They don't um, they don't get a whole lot of uh, attention from the, the viceroy of New Spain. Uh, they're very distant from everything else, so not really a lot of trade comes through there. Not a lot of money gets sent there, and so the people there, even the the monks themselves and the the priests and so forth, they're all living in poverty. And they're usually governed either by uh, priests or perhaps in some cases by a wealthy individual, bureaucrat, or uh, military personnel. Okay? You might have a, a military officer who's kind of lording over everything else. So it's not always necessarily directly um, controlled by the Catholic Church, but in many instances it is. 1598, Spain decides it's going to claim the area north of the Rio Grande River. Okay, so everything... Um, moving across um, into uh, the modern-day United States. Um, and they start to uh, attack native tribes living in the southwest. So the Hopi and the Zuni tribes that live in the area that try to resist the Spanish are all massacred. Um, and the colony of New Mexico is established eventually. And once the Spaniards actually do manage to get into New Mexico, um, uh, sadly, the joke is kind of on them because they expect there to be gold and food waiting for them to get there. Uh, and when they get there, they realize it's just more desert. Okay? And so the natives that they do manage to subjugate, who they don't kill, um, are forced to pay some kind of an annual tribute payment uh, in cloth or in corn because that's really all they have. And the missions themselves become the most prominent centers of oppression that exist. Um, again, there's plenty of uh, manual labor to go around. That's basically the, the primary use for Native Americans at this point is um, slave labor. Okay? And they're subjected to physical abuse and in many cases to sexual abuse. Um, and the other issue, too, of course, is that you know, even if they do survive physical and sexual abuse, um, their immune systems quite often aren't up to the kind of diseases that the Spanish are willing to spread. Okay? And so the Spanish end up giving them smallpox, giving them typhus or something like that that spreads like wildfire and kills them all. So it's uh, 
Um, it's, it's not the kind of destiny that these individuals want. And eventually these missions are secularized after 10 years. The natives are given citizenship if they survive, right? If they manage to, you know, play by the rules of the Catholic priests and so forth. If they do manage to survive the abuse, um, you know, whatever traumatized living situation they have thereafter, um, they are given citizenship. And of course, the other thing too is that sometimes there is a presidio that's attached to all this. Um, and in addition to the different Native American housing that you see around the, um, the edges here, sometimes uh, there's a presidio that is actually built, um, you know, kind of off to one side that's a, a fort of some kind that houses soldiers and sometimes their families if they have some. So um, not always directly, uh, again, a one gigantic church mission, right? Sometimes there is a secular branch as well. Now, over time, as you can imagine, the European presence in these areas uh, is, is a breeding ground for resentment and for revolt. Okay? And that's exactly what ends up happening here. Um, in 1598, um, the Acoma Pueblo natives end up killing 11 soldiers uh, who tried to, you know, stage an incursion into native territory. And Spain decides it is going to react very harshly, and it sends uh, soldiers in who uh, enact a massacre. They kill 500 men and 300 women and children in this particular community. And those who do survive are uh, enslaved and or mutilated. And sometimes they'll have uh, an ear cut off, sometimes a finger, something along those lines, something to humiliate them and or keep them in check. Um, and the individuals who are a few generations removed at this point, right, ones who uh, have been the, um, the product of, um, you know, some kind of relationship between the Spaniards and the natives themselves, people of mixed descent, in other words, are called mestizos, and they're the ones who are the population majority in these areas by the time the 18th century comes around. And the mestizos are the ones who are extremely fed up with Spanish presence. I mean, their own existence, uh, you know, is is a direct byproduct of, of Spanish incursion, right? They, their ancestors may have been raped, uh, anything could have happened. Um, and the Spanish end up turning New Mexico into a royal province by the time 1608 comes around and uh, establish their capital at Santa Fe, which is called, which is uh, the Spanish words for holy faith. Um, the Pueblo Revolt, though, is the major precipitating event here that ends up kind of causing the Spanish to go into decline. And this happens in 1680, and it's led by a fellow uh, named Pope. Okay, kind of ironic that his name looks similar to Pope. Uh, Pope mean, means ripe plantings in the Pueblo language. And Pope, you see here, is kind of a, I mean, this is an artist's representation of him. But he organizes a rebellion to basically throw the Spaniards out of New Mexico altogether. Okay, um, and that's exactly what happens. Okay. He leads the mestizo natives to burn churches, to torture and kill priests, um, and only 2,400 people end up surviving this, and they end up fleeing uh, across into El Paso, uh, and New Mexico is reverted back to native control. Okay. Um, and when this happens, um, the the horses that are left behind uh, are end up being um, given back over to uh, native tribes. And that's exactly what we'll talk about next here. Okay. Um, even though the Great Plains natives are very closely identified with horses, it's not until after the Pueblo Revolt happens that Native Americans gain uh, access to horses. Um, again, the Great Plains is a perfect place for a grazing animal to live. Right? There's millions of buffalo that exist out there already. Um, unfortunately, the presence of European horses actually is part of the reason why uh, buffalo end up going on the decline for so long. It's because they're in uh, direct competition for food now. Um, horses, of course, though, are able to haul supplies more efficiently, um, and it ends up completely changing the culture, right? The culture is not necessarily sedentary anymore. Uh, people can't just sit around and let buffalo, you know, come and go up to them. Now they can actually, you know, chase the buffalo if they want to. Uh, helps people, of course, be more effective when it comes to war, when it comes to hunting. You don't have to do either one on foot anymore, right? It gives you a distinct advantage over your enemy or over your prey. And, of course, bison hunting uh, becomes even more prominent over time, right? It becomes a very big portion of uh, Great Plains culture, 
okay? And so every part of the bison ends up being used uh, for something, okay? You have a ceremonial headdress like this fellow is wearing here. Um, you have tools like a mattock that you see here made of what looks like a shoulder blade. Um, mattock is used for digging up hard soil. You have spoons that look to be made perhaps from shoulder blades and from bones. Um, but this ends up creating more problems actually than people uh, might anticipate. Okay, uh, Of course the bison being overhunted is one that we've discussed already. Um, and the horses depleting prairie grass is another. But also it causes greater competition among tribes, okay? and uh, not just for hunting territory, but also for wealth. Okay? The more horses you have, the more uh, wealth you end up um, in, in, you know, accruing over time. And so the Comanche tribes actually in the Southwest end up becoming the most uh, wealthy uh, Native American tribes anywhere in the country by this point, because they have thousands and thousands of horses. And the Comanche at one point end up actually establishing a Comanche empire. Uh, and end up chasing other tribes out of the way. They end up chasing um, many Europeans out uh, all the way through Texas and New Mexico and even into um, northern Mexico itself. Okay. And the other strange thing too is it ends up changing the, um, the, uh, the sociology of Great Plains tribes because it introduces polygamy. Okay. Um, men are suddenly able to have multiple wives and they end up giving uh, menial tasks to wives. Okay. Uh, causing them to go and tan hides of animals, to take care of the horses, to, you know, to do this, that, and the other. And the men are the ones who actually uh, retain the property. Okay, so this is still a, um, it's a, unfortunately appears to be a European um, import. And finally, when it comes to the Spanish Empire being challenged here, um, other European nations are finally starting to take notice of what the Spaniards are doing in the New World. Okay? Uh, and they realize that there are certain um, elements that they can benefit from. Right? The Spanish have found gold to a certain extent. They haven't really found any food or anything like that, but they have found animals. Um, they have found um, plenty of other things that other nations want. Uh, Giovanni de Varanzo is an individual who's sent by the French king in 1524 to try to perhaps establish a colony. He's actually killed by natives in the process. Jacques Cartier is actually sent by the French and he discovers Quebec and Montreal and Canada. Okay. He's the one who's actually still um, you know, given credit for that. Another major instance that occurs uh, from 1568 to 1648 is something called the Dutch Revolt. And what happens here is um, in Spain, uh, the the Catholic Spanish have, as part of their uh, territory, uh, Protestant Dutch subjects okay, uh, who end up leading a revolt, again, based on, uh, you know, religious ideas uh, against the Spanish, against the Catholics, and they end up, um, you know, taking control of uh, certain colonies in the New World. Okay? So the Dutch Republic ends up being um, formed eventually in Europe out of seven different provinces, and uh, this is how we get the Netherlands. Okay? The Netherlands is where we have uh, places like Amsterdam and so forth today, Holland and so forth. So this becomes independent in 1648, and then the Dutch end up creating new colonies in the New World after that. And finally, Elizabeth I of England ends up hiring Dutch and English privateers to raid Spanish ships. Okay. Uh, privateer is basically a state-sanctioned pirate. Okay. So you might have Elizabeth who is hiring different pirates um, to, to go and raid these Spanish ships to try to basically deter the Spanish from gaining any more success. Because you know, remember, England at this point doesn't have any colonies yet. Spain, of course, figures out what England is up to and decides it's going to declare war. And one final really big event that occurs here, and this is what end up, ends up putting England on the map, is um, the destruction of the Spanish Armada. Okay? And the Spanish Armada is the navy in the world at this point. It is the, the largest navy, the most successful navy. Um, the, the king of Spain ends up sending the entire Spanish Armada to England, okay? to attack England. Okay? So 132 ships with 8,000 sailors and 18,000 soldiers are sent uh, across the English Channel here. And um, they are completely wiped out by what appears to be an act of God. Okay? Uh, a gigantic storm uh, rises up and all the ships are destroyed. Okay? So this is a, a massive win for England when England didn't even have to do anything. And of course, 
Protestants everywhere at this point are, you know, cheering and clapping their hands, believing that God is suddenly on their side. Okay, so um, this is a, a really big, um, you know, feat of vanity by Spain to try to do this, to try to send its full force against England, um, not realizing that the English Channel is a very stormy place anyway, but. Um, Despite that, this ends up causing Spain to go into the decline very quickly. Uh, and thereafter, England manages to build up the largest navy anywhere in the world, um, and it retains that status all the way up until World War I. So we, um, we're, we're entering into a whole new phase here with a lot of this. Um, so now that we're getting through the end of Chapter 1, uh, we'll move on to Chapter 2 pretty quickly here, and we'll start talking a little bit more about the explorations of the English. So thanks a lot. I'll see you next time.